Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, first condensed format of our lecture. This is the first lecture on optimization, specifically an introduction to evolutionary computation. Now we all know what uh, evolution is, so I'm not going to spend more time on that, but in this module we're going to use evolution as a kind of a biological metaphor, if you will, to solve various computer problems. Now, evolutionary computation refers to computer-based problem-solving systems that uses various aspects of the evolutionary process um, in solving problems. These include things like natural selection, survival of the fittest, reproduction, and so forth. Now, there are five key components in any such algorithm. The first of which is an encoding scheme, and this encoding scheme allows us to model a solution, a possible solution to the problem, as some kind of chromosome inside inside the algorithm. Then we need some kind of function and that's going to evaluate the fitness of the solution. So this fitness refers to the fact that some solutions might be better than others and of course we need some way to evaluate that. We need some kind of initialization scheme so that we can bootstrap this whole process. We have to start from somewhere and that's the initialization step. Then we also need some kind of selection operator or operators. You can use multiple ones and this is specifically used to decide which solutions survive to the next generation, which reproduce, and so forth. And then lastly, we need some kind of reproduction operator where we take existing solutions to create new versions of them. And there are various ways of this, typically crossover and mutation, but we'll have a look at that later on. Now the generic evolutionary algorithm is very straightforward. We start by initializing the generation counter t uh, at uh, t equals zero, and then we create an nx dimensional population. This is the initial population in some way. The nx over here refers to the number of variables that you're trying to optimize in your algorithm. So for example, if you have a simple function like fx equals some polynomial, then it's a one-dimensional population. If it's a plane that you're trying to optimize, so fxy equals something, then it's a two-dimensional population. So this refers to the number of dimensions in the problem that you're trying to solve. And of course, you're going to create ns individuals um, in, that, in that population, depending on how many you want, or need rather. Then while the stopping condition is not met, some kind of stopping condition, we're going to first of all evaluate the fitness of every individual xit um, in the population. So this is the fitness function. Then we perform reproduction to reproduce offspring, either mutation or crossover or combination. And then we select a new population from um, to go to the next generation. This could either be only from the children, maybe it's parents and children, it all depends. And then we advance to the next generation. So this is the generic evolutionary algorithm. And all of our GAs, or EAs rather, are going to be based in some way on this generic algorithm. Now as a simple example of uh, evolutionary algorithms, let's consider this artificial life simulation. So what you see here is a number of critters and they are placed in a world with green dots and red dots. Red is poison, green is food. They can sense both and they have to use the sensing in order to turn towards the food, avoid poison, and that way uh, they need to survive. If they don't find enough food, then they die. Once a critter dies, any two existing ones are used to create a new offspring. Um, the idea is then that those that survive longer will have better genes, and in that way um, they will get to a point where they are able to actually survive. Now, as you can see in the initial population, they don't know at all what to do. So they die off quite quickly uh, in the beginning. But let's see what happens if we leave them for a while. As you can see here, after a number of generations, they are actually able to locate food. They move in a more controlled manner and the evolutionary process in this way has improved them to such an extent that they are able to locate the green particles, which is their food, and of course avoid the poison. It's important to note that none of this behavior was programmed into the algorithm. The algorithm discovered all of this behavior on its own. Now the characteristics and the traits of individuals are stored in long strings called chromosomes. Each of these chromosomes consists of millions of genes, the smallest unit of information. 
we need some kind of equivalent to this to store our solution as well. So let's see how that happens. Now the first step is to find an appropriate representation for the candidate solutions. Most EAs represent solutions as a vector of some kind of specific data type. Uh, genetic programming is an exception to this as it uses trees, but typically the choices are either the classical representation for discrete values using a binary string of some fixed length. You could also use an array of, let's say, integers and also floating point values, and these are all equally valid. A combination of this, of course, is also possible, but your operators then require some careful thought. So evolutionary computation algorithms are stochastic population-based search algorithms. The standard technique to initialize your initial population is to just generate a whole bunch of random individuals with random values in the chromosome. Um, you have to ensure, though, that the search base is uniformly covered. So if your search base is not uniform in nature, maybe it's some areas um, are not as smooth as others, then, of course, you could initialize more individuals to, to cover that space. Now, the size of the population um, which may actually also vary during the search, has quite a bit of consequences. First of all, if you have a large population, then of course your diversity is going to be quite large. You will cover more of the search base, but moving from one generation to the next will be much slower. A smaller population covers less of the uh, search base, and there is a good chance that you might actually end up in a local optima. But progressing from one generation to the next is of course much faster. You need to find the sweet spot here. Typically, a good starting point is 10 times your dimensionality um, as a starting point. Now, in the Darwinian model, individuals with the best and the most useful characteristics have the best chance to survive and to reproduce. Now, the fitness function, which might not correlate with the objective function, which is the function you're trying to optimize, um, can be seen as a heuristic function, something like an educated guess to guide the solutions into the dire uh, right direction. There are two kinds of fitness function. You can have an absolute fitness function that can take a solution and associate some kind of numerical value to that. And in that way, you can determine which ones are better than others. So the, usually there's a, it's either an, a maximization or a minimization problem. If it's a maximization problem, for example, then the higher the fitness value, the better the individual becomes. You can also have a relative fitness function where there's no numerical value, but where you can at least say that one individual is better than another. And in many problems, this is the only, sol only solution that you do have. Now, the next component of the evolutionary algorithm is, of course, selection. Now, selection of candidate solution needs to occur in two phases. First of all, selection of the new population, those that survive to the next generation, and also for reproduction. Now, each selection strategy has what's known as a selective pressure or a takeover time, which relate to the time needed to produce a uniform population. Over time, all the solutions are going to be very, very similar. And this is what that takeover time refers to. Now, when you have high selective pressure, uh, you have a short takeover time, and this tends to decrease diversity quite quickly. Low selective pressure has a long takeover time and increases diversity. This plays heavily on this whole concept of, of exploration versus exploitation. You want exploration in the beginning of the program or the beginning of the algorithm to find good areas where optimal solutions may hide. And then exploitation is where you actually, in that area, you pinpoint the exact solution that you want. So the first selection strategy is, of course, random selection. Now this has the lower selective pressure. It has high exploration and low exploitation. Each individual has exactly the same probability of being selected. Now, with a proportional selection scheme, fit individuals have a greater probability of being selected. So let's say we have a maximization problem. So the higher the value, the better the fitness. It can be defined as you see here in equation one. So you have the, the fitness of the individual, uh, as you see over here, uh, which is scaled so that it's always a positive value over um, the, uh, the sum of all the scaled fitness values of all the individuals. And that then becomes the probability of selecting that individual. Now, one algorithm that I would like to mention that you can use to implement proportional selection is, of course, the roulette wheel um, algorithm. 
that you see over here. Now with tournament selection, you select a small subset of the entire group. And from this subset, you either select one or more individuals, depending on what kind of selection that you want. The nice thing about this, uh, this scheme is that you can fine tune the selective pressure of the, of the selection scheme by choosing the size of the population. If you, for example, have a very small subset or very small group that is participating, then of course you have low selective pressure. In the extreme case where your group is only one, you end up with obviously random selection. Um, if your population is very large or your, your subgroup is very large, then it, 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 the algorithm actually starts getting very high selective pressure. So you end up with almost a kind of elitism selection scheme. Now with rank based selection, you simply order your individuals from the best to the worst, and then you use a non-deterministic linear sampling approach to select an individual. And of course, using this approach, uh, individuals that are stored in the beginning of the list has a higher uh, chance of being selected. Something like this um, works quite well. So you take a random value from zero to the number of individuals, uh, minus one, uh, so of course then the, the, the n value here is included and then you take another random value from zero to this value so using this approach um, individuals in the beginning of the array has a higher chance to be selected now with elitism this simply refers to the process of selecting the very best individual in the population to survive to the next population or the next generation um, this is to ensure that your um, I mean, the best genes keep on surviving. This, of course, has maximum selective pressure with absolutely no exploration taking place. Next, of course, is the reproduction operators. Now, there are two main reproduction operators used in some form in all kinds of evolutionary algorithms. The first is crossover. Now, this produces offspring by selecting the genetic material from selected parents, two or more. Uh, this tends to make more radical changes to the chromosome almost like finding the tallest mountain to climb. Mutation, on the other hand, makes small random changes to the chromosome. So mutation uh, and mutation probability should be kept very small. 2% is a good starting point, and then you can change it depending on the results that you're getting. Typically, this is used for fine tuning an existing solution. In other words, climbing the, 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 the high mountain that you have found. Of course, you also need to stop at some point. Now, you could just keep the algorithm running and keep on using the best solution that you found after some time, or you can, you can terminate when you, you find that there's no more changes that's being made to the current solution or the problems or the solutions modeled by the algorithm. That's another way to stop it. Thanks everyone for watching. So this is the first lecture. The next one will be on genetic algorithms and how that is a a specific instance of evolutionary algorithms. Thank you and have a nice day.